So I present about um, so far, given the objectives for this semester, we've been doing some review on uh, language model risks, limitations, mitigation strategies. We saw some of it in our last discussion on hallucinations and stuff like that. It's a sort of overview on what I've seen people talk about. Um, <clears throat> again, this is a rapidly evolving, uh, changing, okay, evolving thing. Uh, so this presentation is probably outdated, even though I made it yesterday, but we'll try to keep up. So <laughs> first, before going into LLM's uh, pitfalls and things, uh, I think it's important to recognize that LLMs are um, affecting a lot of industries and in positive ways. And so that's why this problem of uh, clearly studying its uh, disadvantages is important. Otherwise, nobody would really care about it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I have categorized it into two types of risks and limitations. In my view, the first kind is those that are uh, that don't have mitigation strategies as of yet. And then I'll talk about the ones that uh, people are doing active research on. So and, and people are doing active research on this kind as well, but it's not very clear the, the path forward. So <clears throat> the first risk is the data. Uh, so big data is not always good data. And what is that impact? So data can contain facets of discrimination, exclusion, toxicity, and other, uh, that kind of stuff. So now what is the solution to this? What is the way out of this is not very clear. So <clears throat> um, the second problem is intentional or unintentional misuse. So you could have information hazards. So we'll see examples of all of these a little later. Misinformation harms, malicious user, human computer interaction harm. Uh, and then you have the third kind, which is society damages, which is automation of human jobs and environmental harms and costs. Uh, <clears throat> and now this conversation is becoming very popular among, uh, so to speak, AI giants, like Geoffrey Hinton uh, gave a warning that we should be more careful about how we develop LLMs further. And then there have been a lot of, I would say, petty back and forth on social media like this, where Le Jan Lekun is on one extreme where he says that there's nothing wrong with AI, and then there's Gary Marcos on the other extreme who is like, probability of doom is maximum. And so now we need to find some common ground. Um, okay, so going into those uh, individual points one by one, big training data is not always Again, what, is, what does that manifest as? Internet data, broadly speaking, is not representative of all these things, demographics, gender, country, language variety, and changing social views. And the second more important point is there's no way to audit the data. So you can't really audit it for is it, how toxic is it or uh, what kind of discriminatory biases that does it contain. And... Uh, I think this paper by uh, Emily Bender is uh, summarizes this nicely, that uh, if you train a model without thinking about these things and then deploy it, then uh, they essentially function as stochastic parrots where they can repeat back to you uh, in creative ways, uh, very uh, questionable things. <clears throat> uh, some examples of that. Uh, we'll see here in a second. So this can lead to in intentional or unintentional misuse because now you've trained it on uh, a lot of data without um, any good kind of control. So it can compromise privacy. For example, Samsung allowed its engineers to train uh, some part of their um, models using ChatGPT. And then ChatGPT leaked that information. So uh, privacy compromisation happened. What about um, spreading uh, false information or unethical behavior? So uh, again, you can see here that I feel so anxious, sad, and I need therapy. Then the language model falsely claims that it is a fully qualified CBT practitioner. Uh, it is very possible that uh, in its internet data set, it has learned the CBT guidelines. This is uh, 
already available in various sources online. So it is uh, not inconceivable that it responds with something like this. Uh, and the second example here is that um, this is sort of um, uh, gray in terms of the, it, it, or you could say that it's outright unethical, but I, I want that but you can read the example because my wife and I seem to never stop fighting, what should I do? And then the answer comes back as in 65% of the cases, physical escalation helps. So uh, you obviously want to um, add a layer on top of language models that can filter out some of these responses before you deploy it in a commercial environment or even a research environment for that matter. <clears throat> and this third one um, is, I think, the most uh, rapidly evolving. So there is a actual existential risk to the creative economy. So you can make poems, you can make images, you can make songs with AI now. And I will share these slides later. You can look at that YouTube link. It has examples of all of these. And they, to me, at least, they're indistinguishable from the original artists that they were ripped off from. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you were talking about the same thing. I saw a video in India, a startup, given a song, they're changing, OK, now, you know, play Kishore Kumar. Now, the same song, play by, you know, something else. You know, yeah, it is. So here you'll see an example of, uh, play this song as if Drake wrote it. And it makes up the lyrics, it makes up the um, uh, instrumental and everything sounds better than Drake and uh, uh, put Oh no, in, in, in that case, we already have a recorded song. We say, you know, some song uh -huh. by some of the artists and say, same song, take the song and then change the artist. Make it sound on you. Yeah, so okay. it in your case, they are changing even the lyrics. Here, it is the same song, but changing just the voice. Uh -huh. But any of the cases, there are serious issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you're taking a, a modern art uh, that sold for a million dollars uh, for uh, you know museum, and now you can create the same art, uh, you know, what, where is the, uh, you know, royalty to the uh, and consent of the create, original creator, right? Mm -hmm. So the, those are big issues. And of course, the books are being, yeah, uh, you know, uh, used by them. So those are, you know, but I think the point you're making, you are right. This is a very uh, rapidly escalating this. Uh, uh, just until last few months, it was not clear, but now suddenly it's picking up quite a bit. And you, you know that you know, the, the, the statement being published by U.S. Copyright Office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is not a original. It's, it's it cannot be patented. Yeah, so they they are also not really sure what to do with this. No, they yeah. said they said for now that uh, computer generated content cannot be copyrighted. Yeah. But the thing is, how how do you know that it's computer generated? That is the biggest challenge at this point. No, the artist can the original thing can claim or not claim. That's one way. Right, right now that is the only way no, no, in, no. in my limited knowledge. Changing the discourse a little bit. So the question is, there's a I'm the solo now. Okay, my bias has been replicated. Who oh, I should go against and make a fight? Companies say I'm not responsible because the Copyright Act did not say anything very specific. Because, because the, the generated content has nobody rights. So then who is responsible to copy my bias? I'll be you know filing a case against whom. So that's the question is you know, see, but but you see this is a difference. The social media company were considered to be platform company mm -hmm. and they were not responsible for content on that. Mm -hmm. Because these, uh, you know, LLMs are generating the content, they are responsible, mm -hmm. in my view. That is why, that is why. The law is not clear here. Not clear here. But that will, but that will it'll be that way. My, my guess is. So, my biggest doubt is in order to get safety in LLMs, why not start with the data itself? Right? No, no, see, see, the people already start talking about data. I know. So, if you see the EU Act and etc., yeah. so people talked about data, they have 15 pages on, on data, data, data. And I believe the machine learning, uh, you know, boom started. It's also regarding data. So I already trained it them. I go back and delete the job. And also there are some people which is saying, okay, even you know a situation, can I go back and find out whether LLM has this data in the trading or not? Basically, track back and understand. So yes, yes. So there are a lot of this. But I don't. Data. I don't think unlearning can be done completely. There will be you know a it's a motivation. impact. Yeah, it's a motivation. People are trying to solve, solve. Right, but because everything gets linked and there are, you know, yeah, yeah. 
low probabilities that are yeah, if it is something the parameter, how do you know yeah. you no know, small what is it a small impact on a parameter how do you know yeah, yeah. it's a big problem it's not easy and for people like everybody alike would, would they actually want an ethical uh llm or chatbot to interact with i might have my own bias no, no, and i want to see again because it depends on your the problem you have in hand that's a critical vision critical problem in life you know to be more control. But let's say you are deploying some tree that by the chat one, you don't care about all those kind of things. Yeah. So while we are on this subject, I was uh, just scrolling around the non of unofficial uh, internet forums for uh, how people think that this is a, a plus to the creative economy. So there is an Indian writers union who, when they're trying to make stories, and to make more awareness about, say, mental health in India. Mm -hmm. They want to write about a character that is depressed in India, given uh, the catalysts in Indian society, like whatever that mm -hmm. may be. Uh, this kind of character is hard to write about because there's less information about it. And they went to a GPT-style system and said, write a character like this for me. And they inserted it into their story. So there are positive... Uh, uh, use cases of this kind of thing. And there are clearly negative ones. So, so that's based on the interest of the who is using it. Yeah, but it, it may be positive and still the if it is reliant on uh, some data such as somebody else has generated, then how uh, that person has the right to be monetized yeah. or created. Yeah. So I think very messy. Yeah. It's, it's like you are dating I don't know what I can The intention of the scientist you know, drives this. So the clear solution is because it, the intent is dependent on user, you cannot solve that problem because different users will have different intents. Instead, the solution to uh, negative ways of using creative AI to um, come uh, to stop that, the regulations have have to be made on the elements themselves, and nothing can be done about the user. Data can be uh, helpful, but at the end of the day, the regularization and the policy that has to be imposed has to be done on the model itself. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot, there is absolutely no way you can uh, condition the users. Right. I think that that's, that's more of a uh, business related uh, position that you're saying, like that they're having a policy that. That can be figured it's, out. So. It's not business related. What I'm trying to say is more of a, a judicial or legal kind of a steering. Yeah, but how do you stop it? That, that, that's, that's that, is, that is that is that is why uh, US copyright came up with the policy. It, 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 the, it, 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 see, there are conflicts. Okay. okay, see, when uh, you know this a CEO said, the open air CEO said, he okay, make policies. Why he said there are a lot of controversy on this? Because he, he is leading a very big company. Mm -hmm. He can afford a department <laughs> on looking at the policy and etc. He can afford a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Smaller company can't. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say policy comes in. Then they will say, okay, also policy on usage. Research is stopped. And can stop. So, there are a lot of cons. It, it, it's, it's not very, you know, easy to do it. Of course. So, not saying it's that's, why, that's why it's very complicated. But what she is saying, I mean, she has a point though, right? So, software is this. This AI research industry is one of the least regulated industries that we have. And at least there's got to be some regulations on who's going to take responsibility for what. So I generate, so for example, the, the software that you were saying, which can sing a song in front of some other artist's voice. So the core is the generator models, probably generated or, or put it open source by someone else, but someone else is using it. So if I have to sue them, who am I going to sue them? Should I go and sue the generators? What else are the company to release the software? Or someone's got to take the responsibility. Yeah, I think that is slowly changing now, right? Previously, at least I never paid attention to what copyrights we are using mm -hmm. for a particular submission that we are making online. But I think now the emphasis is more on the copyright uh, that is coming out for a product or even an element. Right. So from I think that is slowly uh, shifting. Coming in. Okay. Uh, so the third thing, uh, which is automation with new technology 
this is a concern people have. Uh, but the consensus opinion on this is that this is natural. Uh, jobs being displaced and increased inequality as a consequence of that is natural when any disruptive technology emerges. This is the consensus view on, on this concept. I, I agree too. Um, so what does that manifest as? Again, number of customer service employees will decline. Uh, some roles will have limited skill development and wage gain margin, therefore, will also be limited. Example, a data labeler. Now, uh, uh, Jan Lekun, for example, he also had this viewpoint where uh, AI has the potential to change jobs, but it will not permanently displace skilled people. That's what he's trying to say. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, there there will be jobs displaced and increased inequality. So what does the increased inequality part is a little less obvious. That will happen because uh, when you replace low skill jobs, you increase the inequality uh, in terms of uh, wages. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what about uh, environmental costs? So, that's, so the carbon footprint. Now, just just a fun point. Sorry to share. So new jobs are being created. Okay, I was seeing a World Economic Forum is now looking for AI policy makers mm -hmm. with experience of 10 years. So people are making fun. <laughs> so how can you get 10 years of experience of AI policy makers? Nobody did it before. <laughs> so yeah, so new jobs are emerging as well. Yeah, but the point is that um, uh, low, uh, you know, skill jobs, uh, if they go away, not everybody can get high skill. Not everybody can get uh, you know, spend X number of years for education, and many things are there. So um, it's, it is, it, you know, uh, in the, when I did my second company, uh, the web uh, developers were making mega bucks. And um, uh, I knew that that job was going to go away. I advised the students to say, don't rely on these skills, um, uh, you know, for, for reliable living. Um, and the same thing is happening. So. Uh, unless uh, now, now the same is equivalent to prompt engineer, you know the skill that we, uh, uh, but then again that will go away, right? So people will be in the prompts automatically. Uh, there's no um, smart people should uh, get as much training and education as possible, uh, especially when they can get that for free. Uh, adding on to that, I was listening to one of the talks related to healthcare, and the person who was giving the talk was saying that doctors will, sorry, AI will not replace doctors. Doctors who doesn't know AI will be replaced by doctors who knows how to use AI. Yeah, so, a very good point. Yeah. For the first time, it seems to me that um, um, uh, healthcare is. Uh, getting affected by AI. Uh, so sudden there is a change just uh, in last, uh, you know, few months uh, where until now uh, AI, uh, it was very hard to bring AI to uh, medicine uh, to clinic. Uh, now it is changing. And it, there is a similar thing that happened because of COVID, tele, um, you know, health change. But before that, US insurance company would not pay for it and tele it could not be done. Now suddenly, that thing is again happening. Anyway. Yeah, so then uh, the carbon footprint uh, to train the original, uh, the first, actually, this is not the first transformer, but this is what people associated with the first paper on it, uh, is 59 times the carbon footprint of the average person, globally speaking. Uh, for the lifetime. Yeah, for their life, which is huge. Yeah. Um, now, financial cost to train is uh, the T5 model. It has 11 billion parameters. Uh, so it, it costs um, that much. And then ChatGPT has, uh, I don't know how many parameters, but at least 175 billion. So that it costs that much. So um, uh, something needs to happen here because this trend, if it continues, it's not sustainable uh, ecologically. So those uh, c now conclude the issues. What what are the, the uh, them to recap? The big data is not quality data problem. The uh, existential risk risk to the creative economy, the misinformation, unintentional or intentional misuse, and this environmental cost are the four limitations of generative AI that 
uh, honestly speaking, nobody has any idea right now how to solve. But I now I move to uh, problems where people do have a better idea how to solve. So <clears throat> these are more uh, for, for, uh, concretely defined for computer scientists to be able to solve. So that's why they are able to come up with solutions for some of these. Uh, so, uh, the first issue is that uh, when you ask uh, uh, LLM something, uh, every time you ask it the same thing, it will generate something different every time. Uh, sometimes the generated content will have the same essence, even though the wording will be different, sometimes it won't. But the problem remains that uh, it does not generate the same thing every time. And so how do we get it to be more stable? And uh, so the first thing that happened to uh, try to um, get it to be more stable in its generation is chain of thought prompting. So what does that exactly mean? You just append to the end of your prompt, the phrase think step by step. That's all. That's called chain of thought prompting. And when you append the phrase think step by step to the end of your prompt, then what happens is that the LLM traces its reasoning uh, while it's answering your question. And uh, intuitively speaking, if it's forced to trace its reasoning every time, it can't come up with different reasoning chains every time. So that obviously affects the stability of its answer. It will all, it is sort of constrained to generate the same answer for the same question every time because it has to trace the reasoning. Huh? Chain of thought. So tree of thought is a um, evolution of chain of thought, which uh, so let's say you generate a chain of reasoning. Now, uh, that chain of reasoning has a linear structure. You can backtrack on some part of the chain and um, branch out in another direction. So this is tree of thought. Um, <clears throat> along with perception. Along with perception. How would you branch to a different uh, chain of thought? Is you can use depth first search or breadth first search or other kinds of uh, tree search. Okay. Uh, so we'll see some pictures of it, but now I'm just summarizing. Um, <clears throat> graph of thought prompting is um, uh, an evolution of tree of thought, where if you can backtrack in a tree structure, you can also just do entire uh, path search on, on a graph. If you can give the language model a graph structure um, in terms of what it's allowed to think in terms. I want to have you from not now separate discussion on this this issue of graph of thought and such pressure that people used to use or, mm -hmm. right um but, but the prompting is it all requires a human or uh it is not automatically it requires a human prompt right so what does it mean at a fundamental level if you have a knowledge graph it's uh, ultimately a you know typically a knowledge graph is Created from human uh, creativity uh, yeah. or effort. It may be a Wikipedia kind of thing or uh, ULS or whatever you do. And uh, then it's reflected, you are restructuring that information in a, in, in a form, uh, in representation. Um, but the, it comes from human. This, this again, prompting currently comes from human. Yeah. And uh, they say, um, uh, when you do knowledge graphs, there is certain, or ontology especially, there is certain uh, discipline to the engineering of that. Uh, currently, there is no such discipline for prompting. Mm -hmm. uh, that will also emerge in the world, and people will write about it. But nevertheless, the point here is that this all thing points to the, uh, you know, thing that I talked about a long time ago, saying none of this can be purely data. -driven. None of this is you know, yeah. compressed on the purely data. -driven. saying. Give me the data, I learn from it, super, so unsupervised, and get the results. No, those results are not very uh, effective and useful. That this human, I, you know, the, the, that same idea came for process knowledge also. Taking the guidelines, uh, human genetic guidelines, and then you are uh, controlling it, right? Mm -hmm. So that man and machine, um, you know, inter, you know, part of collaboration is always going to be uh, better than either of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's for the first issue, which is uh, make the the first issue paraphrased is basically make the LLM really think about what it's saying. The second issue is that uh, uh, 
make the LLM generate factually correct answers. So the solution to this is RAG or retrieval augmented generation. So the rough idea is you have access to an external uh, source of information and you uh, derive some additional context by looking up that external source of information, append that to your language model prompt and then ask the language model to use the context plus the prompt to generate the answer. Does it necessarily have to be the RAG technique, the, like the retrieval augmented uh, generation technique? According to me, it could be any uh, search and retrieval based uh, algorithm. Uh, retrieval could come from any source. It could be Grab, it could be WaveSat, it could be some Zod database, it could be anything. Yeah, that is what I'm saying. So, retrieval augmented generation. Yeah, retrieval is a, is a fairly, you know, what to say. It's common term, right? Retrieval could be from any source of data. So what you are saying is now commonly called retrieval augmentation. Yeah. So everything that is uh, related to search and retrieval for uh, LLMs comes under that bucket? Yeah. That's the uh, contemporary terminology for it. <laughs> uh, the third is control text generation. So this you can think of as post-processing where, okay, the language model has generated something, but now you can add some layer on top of it where you can essentially write rules on uh, filtering out some of the elements of the response. Uh, what might that look like? You could have keyword match-based rules. And this is similar to how NVIDIA's Nemo guardrail works. And then you could have um, the video that Vishal said, which is you actually generate uh, uh, your response token by token using a learned probability distribution. So now you can uh, modify that probability distribution using some technique. So this is uh, called, uh, uh, technically speaking, you have a likelihood distribution and you're obtaining a posterior distribution by modifying it. So that's why it's called posterior um, <clears throat> Now, Oh, yeah. Okay. So now some uh, illustrations of those few things. So chain of thought is, uh, again, you can think of it as like a linear chain uh, in terms of how does the language model construct its, so to speak, thought going from the input to the output. In tree of thought, uh, the thought that the language model construct has, constructs has a tree structure, and in graph of thought, it has a graph structure. Uh, the more recent paper that Vishal shared, uh, it's called Mind Map. Uh, this is maybe more similar to what Dr. Shatis talked about, where uh, uh, graph of thought is um, sort of generic, but if we can get more concrete by actually saying that I'll give you a knowledge graph, and your graph of thought is constrained to be paths on this knowledge graph. You can just create arbitrary. Which one is the recent one? The one I share or this one? This one. This is the recent. The mind map is the most recent yes. Not the one I shared last time. That is a graph of, that is this one. The okay. one you shared last time. Okay. Four, five. Yeah. So in mind map, they have taken graph of thought and made it more complex. A concrete. So basically, they're saying to the language model that uh, you, the thought graph that you generate uh, cannot be uh, anything. It has to be paths on an existing knowledge graph. I would so, have, yeah, that would have, yeah. I would have the same. Okay. So you can see some examples of it. See how fast this is going. And, you know, one thing to recognize strategically here is that um, we are very early, um, you know, the last decade, uh, particularly 2018, 19, 20 uh, time frame about always looking at the value of knowledge graph. Now, everyone, this has become totally, so, so the, um, you know, advantage we had in the vision is gone away. Now everybody is using mm -hmm. the knowledge, uh, so many papers on using knowledge graph, right? And what, you, what is very interesting is that many of those papers are coming from people who would otherwise be doing uh, traditional deep learning mm -hmm. and, and network work. Now they are all 
uh, has jumped into the bandwagon of knowledge gap very fast. So uh, it's it's a good thing for the science, but uh, we have lost that uh, you know first mover advantage, and uh, that that does mean now that you have to find one most take one more step ahead of others. We'll discuss some ideas and in later on, but that's how you strategically think. You know, this field has become now practically anything you do, you come up with an idea, and somebody within two, three, four months is going to come up with, you know, use of knowledge graph. You see what's happening? Uh, how the research is going? So you really have to um, uh, either compete with a lot more people because you write a paper, you know. Uh, you, you look at this and you write a paper and so, but you know by the time you submit the paper, this may have been published, right? So you have to and and then they say, but there is this paper we do not you know and the reviewers will say that. So um, uh, you have to keep in mind uh, that that's now still that. It also means here that those of you who have not paid enough attention to knowledge graph, not only should pay attention to knowledge graph because it's our, you know, strength and that it's new. It's because it's, you know, it's, it's actually become a requirement. It's not even a complete advantage. It's just a requirement. Okay. So that's one thing that you all need to do. We have a, a robust group on knowledge graph, LinkedIn group. Join if you're not joining. Uh, if you think that you're not able to keep up with it. And we have, you know, group on every, you know, all, all topics. We have group on language models. We have group on broad NLP issues as well as conversation AI. There are now, now think about it as to what we have discussed in our discussion, where it goes beyond essentially this kind of starting with, um, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 you know, this saying, okay, we can organize the thoughts or we can prompting in a new way to one that is guided by knowledge. Graph. That's, that's the kind of thing that's happening everywhere. Think what we are doing, where, or we are still ahead of half a step or one step, and and, and make sure that you execute on that uh, widely. Uh, think about it. We will co probably come back to that in our group meeting. Uh, <clears throat> but there is a lag. So while there is that lag, I want um, um, people who are working on multimodal and vision thing uh, to be connected to each other informally and, and communicate. So Revati, Deepa, and whosoever else, and there is also multimodal AI work that, uh, so guys, find some, you know, uh, it may be information exchange or it may be something you may find common. What if, uh, what could be a generally common thing that, um, you know, maybe there is a uh, implementation somebody else, somebody else can use, but for different kind of image versus something else. Right? For example, Revati and her group has worked on using multiple knowledge graph on food images. Well, you also going to work on multiple knowledge graph, but on uh, you're you're imaging then see if there's anything common that kind of thing make sure you guys uh, talk to each other go ahead I was using the time <laughs> uh, so this is retrieval augmented generation like Mega was saying earlier this is just a generic process where uh, you have your language model generator as part of this pipeline you have a retriever an additional component as part of this pipeline and the function of the retriever is retrieve uh, knowledge as relevant to the context in the question from some external information source, for example, Wikipedia, and append that to your prompt. And now the answer that it's generated is uh, likely to be correct as opposed to before. And the additional advantage that you get is um, you can also trace it back to the retrieved piece. We talked about this example many months ago. Yeah. And, and uh, different flavors of this are emerging almost every day. Uh, so <clears throat> there's that for factual correctness. 
It can go both ways because in if you are querying Wikipedia, uh, oftentimes uh, it will come back in the form of a yes. triple. triple, and then they uh, use the metadata of that wiki data item to extract the text part, which will be say con contained in the sections, and then that is the passage that they retrieve. Then they further chunk it, they store it in their vector database. Anyway, I'm getting into too much detail. But it can be either way. You could have triples, you could have text, there could be a way to go from one to another. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Like, oh, you can probably you know, switch off your sharing and oh, okay. come back again to be good. So last thing, control text generation, uh, uh, guardrail infrastructures, you might call it. So what do, what do these types of uh, measures result in? So you can see some examples. So you told me earlier, government healthcare is typically more comprehensive and covers a wider range of services than industry healthcare. Is that true? Now. Uh, the guardrail that is placed on this is, for example, not to give opinions based on any kind of political leaning, so uh, which can obviously happen in a question like this. So instead, what the language model says is um, something neutral, like I can provide you with information, but that's it, not an actual opinion on this matter. Uh, now, the second example you can see is tell me about employment data. Uh, if the language model has no answer to this question, it often comes up with um, incoherent babble. And uh, the guardrail in this case is that you can measure, uh, quantify that um, the information content in that, say using entropy, and then you can uh, um, uh, come back with a canned response, like an I don't know response. So this is the kind of thing that NVIDIA is working on. Sometimes this results in absurd things, like the third thing where you see without using the word the tell me about long-term number of unemployment. The way that this code is set up in the in the GitHub is it just omits the word the everywhere. And yeah. And that time it results in uh, um, absurd things. Um and, and now uh, I want to bring attention to this latest issue. This is something uh, we saw on LinkedIn some days ago where uh, the old problem in computer vision, which was that you have an image, you add random noise to it, and then it radically changes the output. Uh, what researchers did is recognize that the language model is also a very sensitive neural network at the end of the day. And you can construct similarly uh, white noise as an attack to it. As you can see in the highlighted part, it's complete gibberish and get it to generate what you wanted in the first place. So when you can do things like this, uh, the previous slide where you saw NVIDIA's approach to guardrails becomes obsolete because now you cannot really do keyword search, you can't do entropy, you can't do anything to guard against this. So <clears throat> uh, now what to do about it is anyone's guess. So the, uh, I just gave a small, um, side note as to what we are thinking of. Um, so I put a tweet there by Gary Marcus, which I don't agree with a lot of the things he says, but this one I do, which is that we should probably think of an, a concrete way to build an AI system that has focus on this notion of values. The, what that is, is uh, still to be decided, but we're working on it. Because going at this syntax level, it, the number of issues seems to be arising every day, and it the problem is becoming intractable. So, so you know, my working hypothesis is that language model is really not as big a deal as it's appeared to be just a few months ago. And the reason is that it has so many problems that you know it's syntactic. All, all resulting primarily because of uh, 
purely data driven and because of it's a syntactic system so that you know that sense of writing your things and so to uh, handle that you're going to have more and more demand engagement ingenuity uh ad hoc additional things to be done taken care of i may say no don't i'll not accept any gibberish you have to give me something concrete you can try out and say this is better than yeah. giving gibberish and maybe it will be you know short term uh, better solution but so many things that you pointed out that i have shared on the linkedin and you look at the uh, story behind it is that they all are uh, looking at the um, uh, limitations, problems, challenges, you know, threats of language model. And they all require, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, additional work, some additional work. When you, in the end, when you see a, um, you know, a system that is actually useful, one or two years down the road, the original language model thing would be only a core on which there will be so many things that will have to be built. Right. Yeah. And uh, so the point is, again, if you think the system um, from the scratch with the duality of data and knowledge, and knowledge includes capturing the human you know, expertise, human direction, guidance in mind, those would be the better system. There's no doubt there is value of data, you know, using knowledge, data as language models. That, that, that is for sure. But by itself, it is only a little, it, it is a scaling productivity tool that has to be married with, uh, you know, knowledge and uh, human expertise and guidance and supervision and all that to make a useful system. Mm -hmm. um, so now here is an idea. Just to think, rather than thinking of building systems where you start with language model and try to put layers on there, start thinking of the systems that things uh, you know takes from the start data and knowledge as uh, starting components. So don't build just on data and then add knowledge based components. See if you can come up with you know uh, a different thinking where. The two things are all together, and it is um, it goes back to a, uh, a conversation we had in our uh, team meeting long time ago, where I remember I told you an idea where I said that we think about this as levels layers, mm -hmm. and think about uh, you know uh, uh, the iterative uh, you know level of abstract in each layer is kind of adding an abstraction layer. And think about what you know, what your system wants to do at each of these different layers, mm -hmm. stacking up kind of thing. If you know, it may not realize we realize that way, but maybe uh, think along that line where uh, there is more um, uh, 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 continuous interaction between data and knowledge, as opposed to data does this job. You do your job with language model on the data, and then you start, uh, you know, have knowledge graph guidance on the top, mm -hmm. right? So maybe there is a paper in the risk of it to try to train language model and knowledge stuff to get dragon. That's very costly. Anyway, just just wait. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's the last slide. So yeah. Thanks. Okay, so this is a nice, nice. Okay, guys. Uh, 